Hey there, Dr. Anna Maria Hilt, herbalist and microbiologist at Osada Natural Health. Welcome to Monday's Mushroom, episode eight. This week I'm featuring a fungus called cordyceps and specifically how it benefits kidney health. Now, there are hundreds of species of cordyceps. Now, among those hundreds of cordyceps species are those multiple species with a history of medicinal use. And amongst those species, the two perhaps best known species, at least here in the West, that we would be familiar with, uh, with respect to medicinal usage would be Cordyceps sinensis, or what's now known as Ophiocordyceps sinensis because of genetics, and also Cordyceps militaris. Now, as an herbalist, when I think of using mushrooms for kidney health, what comes to the top of the list normally would be cordyceps. Uh, and it's certainly not the only mushroom that has benefits for kidney health, but it is usually the one that pops into my brain. And I certainly didn't invent that. Cordyceps has a solid 2000 years, if not more usage in traditional Chinese medicine to support the kidneys uh, as a kidney protective agent um, and to support our essence. And so let me backtrack. Kidneys are where we store what is known as essence from a traditional Chinese standpoint. And this is something that is inherited from our parents. Our essence underlies what our basic constitution is, how our body works. And our essence is considered to be a major determining factor of our lifelong health. And to be honest, mine is shit <laughs> uh, due to multiple uh, symptoms and such that show up in my body. Um, other people have a really solid essence, but regardless, cordyceps has traditionally been used to support our essence, to strengthen our life energy and also to tonify the kidney yang from a Chinese perspective. One of the ways Ophiocordyceps sinensis, God, that's a mouthful. One of the ways it was used, uh, traditionally speaking, was extracted in wine. Uh, and another way it was used in ancient China was stuffed into ducks that were then roasted. And the beneficiaries of that were older folks and particularly royalty because it used to be that this fungus was only available to the ultra rich. And I'll come back to that momentarily as well. When you hear the term cordyceps, you might think, ew, aren't those the mushrooms that grow in insects? <laughs> and you would be largely correct. So cordyceps and ophiocordyceps and related species are pretty famous uh, for being parasites on insects. And what generally happens is the larval form of a particular bug, whether it's this poor grasshopper here on the left or the ant on the right, will wind up ingesting fungal spores, which then develop in the insect, uh, may even alter the behavior of the insect so that it moves to an ideal location for the fungus to release its spores from. Um, and it ultimately does kill the insect and the fruiting bodies will sprout out of the insect. These club shaped fruiting bodies on the left or these fruiting bodies that actually kind of look like what we would think of as a mushroom on the right. Now, uh, what was I going to say about that? Oh, so the, the fungus develops inside the insect. So the mycelial part of the fungus, the living organism is found inside the insect. And then what we're seeing on the outside here are the fruiting bodies, the, the structures, the reproductive structures. So uh, here is Cordyceps militaris with its characteristic orange fruiting bodies sticking up from uh, this carapace of a caterpillar. Inside that caterpillar is the fungal mycelium, the you know, living organism itself. And here is Ophiocordyceps sinensis. Uh, so again, you're seeing the fruiting body sticking out of the colonized caterpillar. And there's not much left of that caterpillar, quite frankly, just kind of the outer carapace at this point. And this was the form that was stuffed into roasted ducks in ancient China. And if you want to buy these from the wild, we're talking thousands of dollars per ounce. Uh, to buy the, this uh, cordyceps harvested from the wild. So until recently, the main source of cordyceps and ophiocordyceps and such 
was in the wild or from the wild, insect and all. And if you want to see some really great gruesome pictures beyond what I just showed you uh, in terms of uh, insects colonized with cordyceps, you can check out Daniel Winkler's cordyceps blog at mushroaming.com. He's got some great photos that he's personally taken in different parts of the world of cordyceps and ophiocordyceps and such in situ in insects. Um, anyway, most of what's commercially available now is cultivated forms. And so uh, most likely what you'll run into are cultivated mycelial strains of Ophiocordyceps sinensis or cultivated mycelia or fruiting bodies of Cordyceps militaris. And this is also what you'll most often see in research studies looking at the activity of these medicinal fungi. Um, now, let's see, um, a note on buying these. It's important to look at the label if you're buying a commercial cordyceps or ophiocordyceps supplement. It's important to check out the manufacturer's site. You wanna make sure that you're getting what you think you're getting <laughs> in terms of the fungus. Uh, but also uh, what's available commercially is largely cultivated on grains. And uh, so things like brown rice, or oats, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, it just means that you're also getting fermented grains and perhaps some level of non-fermented grains along with the fungus in your supplement. Um, now, there may actually be benefits from the fermented growth substrate, some folks argue that, but again, it means that some fraction of what you're buying, some fraction of that extract or powder or capsule or what have you, is fermented grain. Now. Um, if you want to get a sense of whether there is a lot of starch uh, in the product you're buying, meaning that a significant fraction of what you're ingesting is simply from the grain, uh, Christopher Hobbs in his more recent book on medicinal mushrooms talks about a simple test that uh, you can do at home to get a sense of what you're getting. And you can also look this test up online for measuring starch <laughs> in the product. I'm not gonna get into it here. Um, so coming back to the kidneys now. Here you're seeing a diagram of the a biochemical view, a biomedical view rather, of the kidneys. And so with the, the kidneys have many functions in the body. Among them is filtration of our blood. So you're seeing a, a schematic diagram of a kidney sliced in half and then a blow up of one of the filtration units within a kidney, a nephron, and we have millions of nephrons, but they're tiny and delicate. And when a nephron is permanently damaged, we don't grow a new one. And so people that are going into kidney failure have lost a significant number of their nephrons and their kidney function is suffering as a result. And if kidney function gets down to a certain level, people then need to go into dialysis, which is where there is a machine that's actually filtering the blood in place of the kidneys filtering the blood. So you have to go into the hospital and get hooked up to this machine a certain number of times a week uh, or so, depending on how severe your kidney failure is. Uh, by the way, at the very bottom, the kidney with the little yellow hat on, that little yellow hat is an adrenal gland. And so just by the by, our adrenal glands live on top of the kidneys. So contemporary herbal practitioners in the East and the West continue to use cordyceps and ophiocordyceps for kidney health. Uh, for instance, for protecting against the kidney damaging properties of various medications, just as an example. Um, and before you decide to go on the cordyceps because of the beds that you're taking, you want to talk to somebody in the know to make sure that using this fungus is not actually contraindicated with whatever medication or medications you happen to be on. Okay, now coming to the research, uh, there are multiple rodent models of kidney failure that have found benefits using opio cordyceps sinensis or cordyceps militaris etc um, but more importantly and more relevant to the real world are clinical studies looking at the use of the fungus in kidney failure so for instance there was a study that looked at 
encapsulated cordyceps militaris powder versus placebo in folks with late stage three or stage four kidney failure. And what this means is that their kidneys were either not functioning as well as they should, or the kidneys were getting close to not functioning at all. Uh, this study lasted for three months, and at the three-month assessment point, multiple markers of kidney function were improved in the cordyceps group compared to the placebo group. For instance, uh, EGFR, the filtration rate of the kidneys, which is a marker of kidney function, was significantly better in the cordyceps group versus the placebo group. Uh, EGFR is a very important measure of kidney function. The lower it gets, the more poorly functioning the kidneys are. And when it gets to a certain level, it means dialysis. And if somebody's lucky enough, uh, a kidney transplant if there's one available. Now, um, Let's see, what else do I want to talk about here? Oh, also, uh, <laughs> kidney histology was as w improved as well in the cordyceps group. What this means is that the structure of the kidney looked better when a sample was taken out and stained and looked at under a microscope. Now, there are also, uh, there are older studies looking at this, but this was a, a, a better controlled study than some of those older studies. Uh, now, there is also research in folks who have gotten kidney transplants due to either acute or chronic kidney disease. And uh, these folks are on immunosuppressive drugs that are toxic, actually, unfortunately, but absolutely necessary to prevent rejection of the transplanted kidney. And so there were two studies that were somewhat similar in that uh, they were in transplant patients who were on some of the standard medications to prevent uh, organ rejection. So for instance, uh, cyclosporin A, a toxic drug, but one that is commonly used to prevent kidney transplant rejection, um, steroid drugs, other medications. So in these studies, Ophio Cordyceps sinensis, I gotta have such a hard time saying that, <laughs> was given on top of these standard medications um, and compared to uh, folks that were not given the fungus on top of the standard meds. Now, giving them a placebo on top of their standard meds would have been a better way to control the studies. But regardless, um, uh, in one of the studies where the researchers looked at inflammatory markers, there was a decrease in the level of signaling or mediating inflammatory molecules, things such as TLR4, toll-like receptor 4, NF-kappa-beta, COX-2, and others. Uh, there was a lower incidence of kidney toxicity from the very medications used to prevent rejection of the organs. Uh, liver toxicity was also decreased, again, due presumably to the medications. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, there were fewer lung infections and fewer other complications in the folks that were given the opiocordyceps on top of the medications. Now, something that was interesting in this study is that over the course of the year that the study was done in, uh, the dosage of cyclosporin A was reduced. It could be reduced uh, during the course of this study uh, without increasing the risk of organ rejection. So giving the mushroom powder or giving uh, the, the, the mushroom was, I don't think it was in powder form, <laughs> forgetting now, uh, but the, the folks on the mushroom, on the fungus, uh, were able to have a lower dose of cyclosporin. And so... This brings up the question of how how much of the benefits, how many of the benefits that were seen in this study were due simply to the reduced level of cyclosporin. So, you know, preventing kidney damage, preventing liver damage that would come from a higher dose, and how much was from direct effects of uh, the fungus itself. Don't know, but even being able to reduce the level of cyclosporin A in these patients by giving them this fungus is significant, right? To prevent the toxicity from that drug. And again, a key point here is that, and I mentioned this already, but I just wanna reiterate is that uh, organ rejection didn't go up as cyclosporin dose went down, like it typically would. Now, to be clear, <laughs> the dose of cyclosporin was not reduced in the people not put on the fungal supplement. 
Now, it's been known from prior rodent studies uh, looking at kidney transplantation that uh, cordyceps or ophiocordyceps alone wasn't significant uh, or wasn't uh, sufficient, I should say, to prevent organ rejection. It wasn't immunosuppressive enough to prevent organ rejection. Uh, but apparently, when given on top of some of the standard medications, there seems to be some benefit here. Uh, there was another similar study, again, with Ophiocordyceps sinensis on top of the standard medications that, again, allowed for reduced dosage of cyclosporin A over the course of the study um, without increased risk of organ rejection despite the reduced do dosage of the drug. And there, again, was improvement in multiple parameters around kidney function. Um, also, the researchers noticed that uh, those in the group receiving the fungus had seemed to have slower progression to of chronic, how is this chronic allograph neuropathy? <laughs> uh, what this chronic allograph neuropathy means is basically decreasing function of the transplanted kidney over time. So that decrease appeared to be slowed in the group that received the fungus. Um, again, there are older studies looking into this as well. Uh, now, uh, another way that opiocordyceps and cordyceps may benefit the kidneys is via hypoglycemic effects. So by being able to reduce blood sugar, and there's a whole bunch of research that has looked into that as well as traditional usage. And the reason this is relevant is because when somebody has high blood sugar in the form of diabetes, this damages the kidneys. That elevated blood sugar uh, is, is sticky and it sticks to things like red blood cells and, and other cells and tissues in the body and that clogs the tiny little blood vessels in the kidneys um, and the nephrons and causes problems and ultimately kidney failure. So that is another way where the fungus may benefit by helping to reduce blood sugar levels. And then one final thing I want to mention because I'm teaching about gout this Wednesday, March 23rd, I believe, online, uh, an herbalist's approach to gout. Um, another way that cordyceps benefits the body is by helping to reduce uric acid levels in the body. And so the kidneys, one of their main jobs is to excrete uric acid into the urine. And research has found in rodent studies, as well as in people, that cordyceps and opiocordyceps are able to reduce uric acid levels in people. Um, this may be in part by increased kidney secretion. This may be in part by reduced production of uric acid and possibly by other mechanisms as well. So one other somewhat kidney related tidbit and a shameless plug of this online interactive Zoom class I'm teaching coming up this Wednesday on uh, support for gout. So that's it, a very long video talking about cordyceps and ophiocordyceps and kidney support. Thank you for tuning in and great job if you've actually made it all the way to the end. If you have any questions or experiences you wanna share, comments, etc., feel free to use the comment section. Uh, anyway, take care y'all.